As we eagerly await season two of Squid Game, let's take a look at what happens when the characters from our favorite major animation studios compete in these brutal games. Today we have five Squid Games, one for each of the major studios, Disney, Pixar, DreamWorks, Sony Animation, and Illumination. With that, let the game begin. Disney has a huge collection of villains at their disposal, some of which are iconic and some who are lesser known. But at the end of the day, which of them would survive the Squid Games? So a few rules we need to put in place. Firstly, every character enters the games with no weapons or powers to put them on as level a playing field as possible. Secondly, we are excluding Animal, Immortal, and Pixar villains from this list for a variety of reasons. Only one villain per franchise. So that leaves the players in today's Squid Games as the following. The Evil Queen, The Coachman, Lady Tremaine, The Queen of Hearts, Captain Hook, Corella Deville, Madame Mim, Edgar, Madame Medusa, Amos Slade, Mr. Sykes, Ursula, Gaston, Jafar, Governor Radcliffe, Judge Frollo, Shan Yu, Clayton, Yzma, Commander Rourke, Gantu, John Silver, Alameda Slim, Bowler Hat Guy, Dr. Facilier, Mother Gothel, Turbo, Hans, Yokai, and Namari. With our rules and players out of the way, we get to the first game on our list. That of course being Red Light, Green Light. Red Light, Green Light is a game about level-headedness, listening to instructions, and the ability to cross long distances in short time. With this said, we know that a good chunk of players tend to die in this game because they are unaware of the true nature of these games. The players most likely to die in this category are those who can't follow instructions, and those who aren't level-headed since every one of these villains are physically fit enough to cross in the time allotted. A few villains are shoo-ins for survival in this game. Bill Sykes is one of the most level-headed in Disney history, Jafar is one of the calmest, Frollo is a godly man and would have no problems following the instructions provided, and Shan Yu is especially calm and collected and would easily survive this game. We feel like the first villain ever would also be the first to die. The Evil Queen is vain enough to the point where she'd probably not listen to instructions given to her. She's also not shown to be as level-headed as one might think. And even if she were to survive the first game, we doubt that she would make it much further than the second one anyway. Due to her bad temper, we also have to strike the Queen of Hearts. The Queen of Hearts, much like the evil queen before her, is vain and doesn't listen to reason or instructions very well. Not to mention her bad temper might cause her to act out indignantly and may make her react poorly when the first shot rings out. But more likely than anything, she'd probably immediately attempt to cheat, like she does in Wonderland, which would result in a quick bullet. <laughs> The next villain who would be eliminated early is Madame Mim. Mim is a witch and rival of Merlin from the Sword in the Stone. However, she has quite the big head and is overly confident throughout her appearances. Not to mention being quite the hypocrite. Due to her overconfidence, she probably thinks she would survive the shots, but without her powers it's very unlikely, not to mention her breaking rules for fun. The one we're sad to see go this early is who ends this section. That being Michael Yagubian, also known as Bowler Hat Guy. Goob is quite deranged, not only does he keep a grudge against Lewis for 20 some odd years, but is also a slave to Doris and is not level headed in the slightest. He would definitely be one of the first to go. Surprisingly, only a few were deranged or not level headed enough to be eliminated in red light green light. With 26 out of our starting 30 still alive, we now move on to the honeycomb challenge. The honeycomb requires two major skills if one wishes to be successful in its game. Those two skills are the patience required to slowly but surely poke out the necessary shape and the steady handedness that would stop you from breaking the cookie. Some of the more patient and steady handed villains that would survive this section include Edgar, who has a steady hand due to his butler skills, not to mention his patience. Governor Radcliffe is also heavily patient, and despite his heavy hand, is steady handed enough to easily use old fashioned muskets. Clayton is a patient enough hunter with a steady hand as well, which means he probably clears it pretty quickly too. And Prince Hans is also patient enough to pull a long con, so he'd likely pass the game too. With the lack of patience necessary and big beefy hands, the coachman can't go any further. He's shown to be quite quick to anger, which adheres to his severe lack of patience. It's also worth noting he only has four fingers. 
which won't make it easy to finish the cookie correctly. And sadly, we also see Captain Hook get eliminated here as well. That is, of course, due to his obvious hook for a hand, is gonna make this challenge very difficult. And regardless of that, his incompetence would probably cause him to break the cookie in and of itself. Another iconic villain to be eliminated is Corella Deville. Corella seems to have the steady hand of a smoker, but that won't save her due to her intense impatience. She constantly acts on impulse and doesn't wait for anything except the law. She was willing to run over dogs for a coat and didn't care how they died as long as their fur was intact. She would fall rather quickly due to her lack of patience, but if she didn't have that character flaw, she might have survived. Barely making it through the last game, Amos Slade definitely dies in this game. He's an older man and a hunter with a shaky hand, which makes him very hard pressed to pass this challenge. He's also one of the most impatient characters on our list, so it makes sense that he would either give up or break the cookie pretty quickly. We also have to eliminate Captain Gantu. Gantu seems to be a patient person for the most part, however, he only has three relatively large fingers that would cause him to break the cookie pretty quickly which puts him at a pretty massive disadvantage at this game. Finally, John Silver has to go. John Silver is at a disadvantage as well, as he only has one arm, and due to his mechanical arm giving him an unfair advantage, it is excluded from the list. Sorry, rules are rules, and it would be near impossible for Silver to pass this game, hence the elimination. With the honeycomb cookies cut out, we now have 20 of our original 30 left, and we get to the next game on our list, the Midnight Brawl. So technically this wasn't an official challenge. The Midnight Brawl happens in between the Honeycomb game and Tug of War, sparked by a lack of food and a prosperity for violence. Only one thing is necessary to survive the Midnight Brawl, and that is the ability to fight or fend off large groups of people in combat. However, if a person is stealthy or smart, they can also survive the game by staying silent and hiding. Due to the fact that there's two ways to win this game, there's a good list of people who survive it. Gaston is a skilled fighter who no doubt survives, Lady Tremaine is smart and sneaky enough to stay alive, Shen Yu is a heavily skilled combatant that easily slays the others, Jafar is smart enough to stay in the shadows, and Namari is a highly skilled martial artist. The first to go during this game is Edgar. He lacks the intelligence, strength, youth, stealth skills, and hand-to-hand -hand combat ability necessary to do well in the Midnight Brawl. His only real ability is his manipulation, which isn't all that helpful here. It's no surprise that Yzma is eliminated here as well. She is relatively popular and quite well known, and has a few strengths that others do not. But where she falls short is her skills in combat. Due to her skinny, bony body, she lacks both strength and fighting ability. Even though she's smart, she also has a big ego, which might put a relatively large target on her back. Alameda Slim gets eliminated too. He may have the size advantage in a fight, but due to his lack of hand-to-hand -hand combat prowess, he's not going to be able to stop if he's ganged up on. He also lacks the intelligence or stealth skills to hide during the night, which means his only defense is his size. The game hopping Turbo rounds out this category as well. Turbo, like the others who fall in this category, has a surprising lack of fighting skills. This, plus his short stature and lack of intense brain power, stops him from being able to win in a situation like this, especially if he's ganged up on. With most of the villains left being highly intelligent, not many lives were claimed during the Midnight Brawl, leaving us with 16 out of our original 30. But more lives will be claimed during the Tug of War. While Tug of War is a team game, we aren't assigning characters to specific teams. The likelihood of their death comes from their abilities. Those abilities are twofold, their physical strength and pulling the rope, and their propensity for teamwork. If someone is strong but not able to work in a team, they may still survive, although it is less likely. And if someone is able to work in a team but is not physically strong, their survivability is also less. Because of their intense strength or teamwork skills, the following are more likely to survive. Bill Sykes is a pretty strong guy. Gaston has near superhuman strength. Frollo also has surprising strength for his age, and Shen Yu is really strong as well. 
Clayton may not be the strongest, but he is a team player, and Commander Rourke not only has surprising strength, but is actively a team player compared to the others, hence why he survives. Barely surviving the Midnight Brawl due to her intelligence, Lady Tremaine is eliminated in Tug of War. She's not only old and frail, which means she's unlikely to be helpful, but she also refuses to work on a team and hates other people, even her own daughters. So it's a no-brainer that she would be eliminated during this game. We're also eliminating Medusa as well. Much like a lot of the villains left in the games, she's a leader with a few minions. My precious pets. She doesn't have much in the way of strength, and she's honestly not that good of a leader either. Also getting eliminated is Dr. Facilier. As much as we love him, Facilier is relatively skinny, and most of his power comes from his magical abilities from his friends on the other side. So due to a severe lack of strength and his lack of ability to play friendly on a team, he's not surviving this round. In a similar vein, Mother Gothel also dies here as well. Even with her youth, Gothel has nothing more than average human strength. And not only that, much like Facilier, she's sort of a loner as well, so not much of a team player. Finally, we have to eliminate Robert Yokai Callahan. Callahan is not a team player, which is already a strike against him, but his strength is also nothing to write home about. Combine these two factors with him being a bit on the older side, and he doesn't make it past this round. With Tug of War over and more villains falling to their death, we're left with 11 of our original 30 as we head into the marble game. To win the marble game, it really comes down to your manipulation skills. Being able to manipulate the other player into losing their marbles is what is necessary to win. So being unable to manipulate another or being easily manipulated makes you a shoe in for losing. The master manipulators on our list are the ones who are likely to survive this game. Those include Ursula, who is able to manipulate Ariel and Triton, Governor Radcliffe, who is able to manipulate the King of England, Prince Hans is a master manipulator, more so than most, and Judge Frollo is about as manipulating as you can get. And this is my thanks for taking you in and raising you as my son. The first in this challenge to go is Bill Sykes. Sykes has passed each of the previous games due to his impressive strength and size, as well as his patience and level-headedness. But where he fails is his lack of manipulative skills. He tends to use his intimidation to manipulate, but when someone isn't scared of you, this falls flat. Sykes fails because no one left in the games would be scared of him for a variety of reasons. After all, you can't use violence in this round. We also have to eliminate Gaston. Gaston is charismatic, there's no doubt about that, but he's also dumb as a box of rocks. This guy is beating no one in a game of wits. We're sad to see him go, but Shen Yu gets eliminated next. He fails due to his lack of manipulation skills. While he is a great leader who is commanding and intimidating, he isn't shown to be manipulative and instead gets things done through brute force. And we also have to see Clayton go as well. Clayton is a considerable threat in many areas. He's relatively strong and quite the fighter. However, he falls short when it comes to manipulation. He lacks any major manipulative abilities, and it's not hard to see why. Where are the gorillas? Since he doesn't really deal with civilized humans during his film, and is mostly just up against Tarzan. Finally, we sadly have to eliminate the newest villain on our list, Namari. Much like the other villains in this section, she has some genuinely decent manipulation skills. She's also relatively small and tends to only manipulate people to protect her clan and family. That said, she doesn't stand a chance against masters of manipulation like Jafar or Frollo. And with only 6 of our original 30 left, we get to the second to last game on our list. That of course being the Glass Stepping Stones. It's hard to rank how likely someone is to pass this game unless they have the skills to tell the pieces of the glass bridge apart. The first to die in this section is Ursula. While her ego is not necessarily the biggest, there's enough of one for her to pick a number on the lower side, probably number one. Plus, due to her being underwater most of the time, it's also highly unlikely that she would know or care which of the glass panels were tempered or not. Another iconic villain to die here is Jafar. His ego is a bit higher than Ursula's, especially due to his dreams of becoming a sultan. He may have a keen eye when it comes to the glass, but it's hard to say for sure. Jafar's ego would probably lead him to pick number one. 
Radcliffe is next to go as well. He's the least egotistical of the villains in this section, but he still has enough of an ego where he wouldn't survive long in this game. He'd likely get aggressive and push others, but we see him being pushed off in response himself. However, Prince Hans has the biggest ego in the room. He has an ego the size of a house and thinks he deserves everything from Arendelle and more. While he's a master manipulator, his ego would definitely cause him to pick number one and would probably be the first one to go. And with that said, we're down to the final two as they battle it out in the titular Squid Game. The Squid Game comes down to one-on-one -on -one dueling. So really, the thing that causes victory in this scenario is their skills in hand-to-hand -hand combat in a one-on-one -on -one scenario. On top of understanding the rules to Squid Game, of course. This makes the outcome relatively easy to predict, but still something that needs to be explained. The two who have survived up until this point are Judge Claude Frollo and Lyle Tiberius Rourke, both of whom are surprisingly strong. They're both well-known manipulators and level-headed leaders. But of those two, only one is able to survive and become the winner of the Squid Games. And we have to say that the person who dies in this game is Judge Frollo. While he is a master manipulator, highly intelligent, and one of the most evil villains in Disney history, he does fall short in his lack of combat experience. He has a surprising amount of strength, but when up against Commander Rourke, he really stands no chance in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So the victor of the Squid Games is, to our surprise, the wrathful Commander Rourke. Rourke is a highly skilled combatant, has above average strength, and is relatively powerful when it comes to manipulation. And for those reasons, he goes home with all the money. You let one ant stand up to us, then they all might stand up. In terms of animated villains, Pixar is right up there with Disney and DreamWorks in terms of great ones. From strong foes and bullies to crafty manipulators to intimidating supervillains, Pixar has them all. But how would they do when put up against each other in what has become a pretty infamous competition? Well, you guys asked for it, so let's find out. I'm Caleb with Wicked Binge, and I'm here to tell you which Pixar villain would win Squid Game. This is probably one of our most unique casts so far, with only about a third of them being human or human-esque. Still, we're going to try to have everyone on as equal of a playing field as possible by banning weapons, powers, and extraordinary abilities. Also, any of our toy or bug-sized contestants will be scaled to human size. It won't be entirely perfect, admittedly, but as we said, some of Pixar's villains are pretty out there. With that detail out of the way, our contestants are Sid Phillips, Hopper, Molt, Al from Al's Toy Barn, Stinky Pete, Emperor Zerg, Randall Boggs, Henry J. Waternoose, Philip Sherman, Bomb Voyage, Syndrome, The Underminer, Chick Hicks, Chef Skinner, Professor Zundap, Sir Miles Axelrod, Ernesto de la Cruz, Charles Muntz, Mordu, Lotso Huggenbear, Thunderclap, Johnny Worthington, Jangles the Clown, Evelyn DeVore, Gabby Gabby, Urkel Visconti, and Ming Lee for a total of 27 contestants. So let what is sure to be our strangest Squid Game yet begin. As always, we'll start with our first game, Red Light Green Light. Red Light Green Light is a game that's all about speed and sharp listening skills. The goal is to make it to the finish line as fast as you can. However, if a player is too focused on the finish line to realize when a red light is coming up, or if they easily panic and accidentally move or stumble when they're supposed to freeze, this game could spell their doom. Someone who does surprisingly well in this game is Jangles the Clown. While he may be silly, he's a character who's probably used to playing children's games and thus would catch on quickly, all while keeping good spirits. Another ace in this game would be Chef Skinner. While his height may be a slight disadvantage, Skinner is used to having to listen to orders while absorbed in the hectic nature of a kitchen. We think he would have no problem hearing and then following directions. Everyone's favorite creepy lizard Randall would also do well in this game. Even if he wasn't allowed to use his camouflage ability, his multiple limbs and quick speed would help him cross the finish line long before many of the other contestants. The same could definitely be said about Waternoose, as we've also seen just how fast he can go despite his age. Gotta love having multiple legs. On the other side of the coin, someone with a huge disadvantage in this game is definitely Mordu. Because he fell to madness, he's basically a feral bear. In other words, he isn't going to really understand the commands. It might take a lot of bullets to stop him though. We also feel that Thunderclap would fall in this game. If we prevented him from using his wings and his ability to fly during the competition, we feel that he would definitely struggle both to keep balance and make it across the finish line. Unfortunately, Pixar's latest antagonist, Ming 
Lee is likely to be eliminated in the first round as well. She has a tendency to freak out over any situation, whether it's unleashing her inner panda at a teenage concert or her inner Karen at the Daisy Mart. When the bullets start flying, we doubt that she'll remain still. Our final person to die in this game is Molt, the younger brother of Hopper. It's very easy to see why, out of the two of them, why Hopper is the leader. Malt is usually easily intimidated, and we feel that he'd be quick to panic once the bullets started flying, causing him to lose. With 23 of our villains surviving, it's time for our next game, The Honeycomb. The Honeycomb game requires patience and a steady hand. Too much shaking or pressure could cause a fatal break. As such, our contestants will need to have enough focus to poke out their shape without accidentally breaking it. So let's just get this out of the way quickly. This is where being a Cars villain really sucks. And not just because that franchise is considered a bit of a low point for this studio. We still aren't completely sure how the Cars society is able to build things without them, but having no hands in this game is pretty much a death sentence. So, to no one's surprise, Chick Hicks, Sir Axelrod, and Professor Zondav are all getting sent to the scrapyard. You know, no arms and all, is it fair? No. But hey, that's life. We also have to unfortunately eliminate Lotso Huggenbear. Plush, stubby hands are still better than no hands, but not by much. We could easily see Lotso dropping and accidentally breaking his cookie within a few minutes of the game starting. Another Toy Story villain, Sid, is also eliminated in this game. Sid is an energetic and very destructive kid. In a game that requires patience and a steady hand, we just don't think he would cut it. Our final death is going to have to be Jangles the Clown. Despite doing so well in the last game, his big glove-covered hands would certainly be a huge disadvantage. But judging by the next game in our competition, we don't think he would have lasted that much longer anyway. Well, that was a pretty deadly round. Looking at our remaining contestants, we're left with 17 Pixar baddies still standing. Following the Honeycomb game, we of course have the Midnight Brawl. Lack of food and sleep, plus the stress of staying alive can drive any person to the point of violence. And in these games, it's every contestant for themselves. To survive this game, a person must be either strong enough to fight or clever and sneaky enough to hide. So, who would be able to either fend off attackers or properly hide themselves until the brawl was over? Our supervillains of this competition from The Incredibles 1 and 2 certainly thrive in this game. Even without powers or gadgets, they all have basic combat and stealth skills and could certainly defend or hide themselves. Another character that does well is actually Stinky Pete, although he plays more on the defensive than the offensive this time around. We saw in Toy Story 2 how stealthy he could be when he was able to turn on the TV without anyone noticing. So, even if he was no longer the size of a toy, we feel that he could hide himself fairly well. Randall would also fall along those same lines, being able to still be skilled enough to hide himself even without his invisibility. We also saw in the first Monsters, Inc. just how easy it was for him to strangle someone, so yeah, don't underestimate Randall. For our first death of the game, we had to go with the fairly clueless dentist, Philip Sherman. I mean, the guy's a middle-aged dentist, not exactly a fighter. His career might have given him a lot of advantage in the last game, but here, not so much. Similarly, Al also dies here. He's even more out of shape than Sherman, and we felt that he wouldn't be smart enough to know how to hide himself either. Making it about as far as we expected, Charles Munt's time in the games stops here. Munt's is a very prideful and slightly insane man. We're sure that he'd rather fight than try to hide, feeling that he could easily beat anyone who dared challenge him. But while his determination may be strong, his body likely wouldn't last very long. Our final death in this brawl, Urkel. Now granted, we do see that Urkel is able to throw a decent punch, that is, when fighting people his own size. While he's not exactly a child, we highly doubt he's only 16 like he says he is. Urkel is still a bit on the short side. I'm 16. You said that last year. Also, much like Munz, we feel that he would overestimate his physical abilities against stronger opponents. With several more contestants permanently down for the count and 13 villains left standing, it's time for another strength-based game, Tug of War. Unlike the actual Squid Game, we aren't going to assign characters to specific teams. Instead, we're simply going to judge them based on their abilities and likelihood to survive. To win Tug of War, you don't just need strength. You also need strategy and a willingness to work with others. 
even weaker players have a shot at surviving if they can coordinate properly with stronger players. Being someone who ran a company for several years, we feel that Water News would have both the strategy, teamwork skills, and the personal strength needed to win this game. Similarly, Chef Skinner knows how to give orders and keep a team in check. Even if he isn't too charismatic and is awfully prideful, we feel he isn't enough for his team to just ignore out of spite. Good thing too, as we doubt he would have had the physical capability to pull out a win all on his own. As the leader of the Grasshoppers, Hopper certainly knows how to command an army and would know how to properly utilize those on his team. Another team player is Johnny Worthington. As the de facto leader of Roar Omega Roar and the legendary Scare Games champion, Johnny should pass this round with no problems at all. As for those villains who end up taking a long trip down, Gabby Gabby is one of the first to die. Even when scaled to human size, she's still essentially a little girl, and likely has the strength of one too. Coincidentally, another toy to die here is Stinky Pete. Again, we have to take his physical capabilities into account. While Pete may be a bit of a manipulator, he's no super genius strategist. That combined with his lack of muscle easily spells his doom. Unfortunately, someone who doesn't play well with others is Randall. If he thought he knew better, he'd probably just do his own thing, only to realize far too late what a bad idea that was. This is also where being a skinny and super light lizard becomes a huge disadvantage. Last to die in tug of war is the former pride of Santa Cecilia, Ernesto de la Cruz. Ernesto may be fairly physically fit, but he can also be a coward, prideful, and a total narcissist. Much like Randall, if he simply refused to trust his teammates, we just can't see him lasting very long. With another game done and over with, we're left with only 9 contestants. Up next, we have the Marble Game. Marbles is an interesting one, at least in the context of Squid Game. There are multiple ways for pairs of players to play their marble game. They could focus on accuracy or how far they can roll their marble, or they can simply guess how many marbles are in their opponent's hand. As such, there are multiple ways to win, with most of these ways relying on either skill or luck. Of course, if you don't have the skills to win, there's always manipulation. To get our biggest winners out of the way first, Hopper, Waternoose, Syndrome, and Evelyn Dever are all considered intelligent villains of their movies, able to manipulate and plan ahead fairly well. Though a bit prideful, especially in Syndrome's case, we ultimately feel that they would be smart enough to make it through this game without too much trouble. We also feel that Skinner would make it through because, ironically enough, this guy's paranoia and mistrust of others would make him very hard to trick. Though he has no extraordinary skills to make him great at marbles, we feel that he would just barely make it through. So that leaves us with the losers of this round. Now, Zerg is a pretty simple character, both in Toy Story 2 and in the animated Buzz Lightyear series. And we're sure he'll be a fairly basic, though still cool, villain in the upcoming Lightyear. Point is, with how much of a simple villain he is, others could easily trick him if they really wanted to. Looking at Johnny Worthington, the guy's obviously more of an athlete. He may be great at leading others and mastering scares, but we can't see him being too great at being a manipulator given that he can't exactly rely much on peer pressure in this situation. Much like Zerg, the Underminer is a pretty simple villain. He knows what he wants, usually cash, and tends to focus on that. While he may know a bit about drills and engineering, that's basically the extent of his intelligence. He's no puppet master or manipulator, and that ultimately seals his deadly fate. Now, this last death may be a little unfair, but hey, what can you do? Bon Voyage dies in this game simply because of a language barrier. While he can understand English, he doesn't seem to speak it, according to the film at least, which means that he couldn't try to manipulate others. With no other skills that could give him an advantage in the actual game of marbles, we had no choice but to end Bon Voyage's time in the games here. We're now officially down to our final five, and just in time for one of this competition's deadliest games, Glass Stepping Stones. This game is another tricky one for a hypothetical scenario, as much of this game relies on luck. There is one strategy to it, however, that being the advantage of going last, after some glass pieces have already been broken. As such, those who have a big enough ego to want to try a game first will likely seal their doom. Having made it this far, it's a bit of a shame to see Syndrome die here. Certainly a fan favorite, Syndrome could have easily gone all the way if not for his ego. Although he can be patient at times, judging by how long it took for him to craft his ultimate plan in the first movie, we feel that Syndrome 
Syndrome would be feeling pretty damn confident by this point. This would result in him likely picking one of the first numbers, never a good thing in this game. Similarly, Chef Skinner dies soon after. If he thought there was some sort of advantage to him going first, he'd certainly take it. Too bad for him, there's no such advantage here. His only saving grace would be his likely willingness to push someone, but given that he would be going first or second in this game, Skinner wouldn't exactly have that chance. The last villain to die in this game is Monster Inc.'s former CEO, Waternoose. Between our three remaining baddies, Waternoose seemed the most likely to pick a middle number instead of hanging out in the back and waiting as long as possible to go. Additionally, being such a big character, Waternoose would have an even harder time jumping across the glass bridge when compared to the other characters. Just like in the show, our final challenge will be a one-on-one -on -one duel in the titular Squid Game. In this game, two opponents must go up against one another, with one acting as defender and the other one as an attacker, with the attacker doing everything they can to reach the top of the court or the squid's head and touch it with her foot, with the defender doing whatever they can to stop them. Or at least, that's how Squid Game is traditionally played. Here though, it's more of a battle to the death type of deal. Alright, we've got a terrifying human-sized grasshopper versus a villainous and vengeful CEO who knows her way around tech. Hopper vs. Evelyn. Both characters can be cruel and ruthless, and both would likely try their hardest to win. So, who comes out on top? Ultimately, we decided that it would be Evelyn who would ultimately fall. Even if he wasn't allowed to use his wings, Hopper is still fairly strong and is willing to get his hands dirty when he needs to. After all, he kills three of his grasshoppers at once just to make a point. In nature, it's all about survival of the fittest, and Hopper knows this better than anyone. As for Evelyn, while her basic combat skills would at least make it so the fight didn't end instantly, at the end of the day, she's just an ordinary human woman. She can fight, but she's no brawler, nor is she professionally trained. And without any access to weapons or hypno-goggles, we just couldn't see Evelyn winning this fight. So, our winner is Hopper. We aren't quite sure what an insect is going to do with a ton of cash, but even so, we're sure he'll be happy that he can at least use this experience to help him further intimidate and control other bugs. Who filled my head with dreams? Ha! Who drove me to train until my bones cracked? Who denied me my destiny? I'm Caleb with Wicked Binge, and today we're going to find out which DreamWork villain would win the Squid Games. All villains enter the games with no powers, weapons, or enchantments, putting them all on the evenest playing field possible. The players of today's Squid Game are the following. Ramses, Zetzelkan, Mrs. Tweety, Lord Farquaad, The Colonel, The Fairy Godmother, Prince Charming, Lord Victor Quartermain, Vincent, Leighton T. Montgomery, Tai Lung, Makunga, Galaxar, Rumble Stillskin, Titan, Lord Shen, Humpty Dumpty, Chatel Dubois, Pitch Black, Guy Gagne, Miss Grunion, Drago Bloodvist, Captain Smack, Chef, Francis E. Francis, Professor Poopy Pants, Grimmel the Grizzly, Dr. Zara, Hendrix, and Dr. Irwin Armstrong. We now start with our first game, Red Light, Green Light. To survive in the game of Red Light, Green Light, there's a couple of things that might help you. Firstly, a level head is required to stay safe because only those with a level head would be able to stay still when shots start to ring out. Secondly, being able to listen and comprehend the rules and then follow them as not to die. Some standout survival Survivors of this game include, but are not limited to, Militia Tweety, who despite her temper is quite level-headed and seems to be a good enough listener. Colonel George Custer is military trained, which means he is quite level-headed and has amazing listening skills, making him a shoo-in. Chantel Dubois is slightly deranged, but otherwise level-headed with amazing listening skills that she needs to hunt down animals. And Grimmel the Grizzly is very level-headed with amazing listening skills that make him one of the biggest threats in this game. But not everyone can survive this game, such as us sadly eliminating Ramses. Ramses is the pharaoh of Egypt and is stubborn, obstinate, and headstrong, making him hard-pressed to survive in a game such as this where those traits are not great. Also not a survivor, Captain Smack also dies during this game. Smack was the captain of the Boove, but is highly foolish and not that great of a listener to any degree. He doesn't survive because his foolishness and lack of a level head cause him to quickly fall behind in this game. The final villain in this section to die in this game is the chef. 
a Bergen who does exactly what her job title entails. She's gone heavily deranged due to her failure to cook and serve the trolls, which wouldn't help in this game. While her listening skills are average, her sheer unhinged mind definitely cost her the game. We still have 27 of our original 30 participating in our next game, that of course being the Honeycombs. The Honeycomb Cookie Challenge requires two major skills if you wish to surpass it and survive. Those two skills are the patience required to slowly exhume the shape from the cookie and the steady hands required to remove the shape without breaking the cookie. The villains who are most likely to survive this game include Zetzelkan, who is very patient and is also steady handed enough to conduct a wide array of rituals, Lord Victor Quartermain, who is patient enough to be a skilled hunter and is steady handed enough to be a great marksman, Tai Lung, who despite Despite his weird paw hand mixture, is masterfully patient and has a masterfully steady hand, and Pitch Black, who is patient enough to wait thousands of years and seems to have a steady hand. Sadly, we have to see Militia Tweety go, who did pretty well in the last game. She is not a patient individual in the slightest, and while she seems to have a steady hand to some degree, her lack of patience really kills her. Another individual we see go is Vincent. Now, Vincent is relatively patient, however, where he fails is his big fat bear paws. He doesn't even have anthropomorphized style hands, he just has big, fat bear paws. Due to the lack of an opposable thumb, even with his semi-skilled hands, he still wouldn't survive. Sadly, we have to also see Titan go during this game. This is mostly due to his overwhelming strength and general idiocy, he would probably break the cookie upon grabbing the cookie. But not only that, he isn't very patient, as evidenced by his lack of patience with his crush Roxanne. He may have a steady hand, but it's still a heavy one which may cause him problems. This is the last time you make a fool out of me! Finally, the lion Makunga falls into a similar category. His line biology and lack of an opposable thumb already brings him down severely. And on top of that, he's not a very patient individual, he definitely fails this game. With 23 of our original 30 still around, we now get to the next game on our list, the Midnight Brawl. The Midnight Brawl happens in between the Honeycomb Cookies and Tug of War, consisting of most of the contestants battling and killing each other to get ahead in the game. To survive the Midnight Brawl, you must be proficient in one of these areas. You are either a great hand-to-hand -hand combatant who can handle a large group of enemies at one time, are highly intelligent and know how to successfully avoid others, or have skills in stealth and are able to hide from your opponents. Some of the choice survivors in this game include, but are not limited to, Lord Farquaad, who is highly intelligent and also a skilled sword fighter and hand-to-hand -hand combatant. Galaxar is highly intelligent and a skilled hand-to-hand -hand combatant in both groups and singular duels. Rumble Stillskin, whose sneaky and conniving ways mixed with his intelligence make him a threat to be reckoned with. Finally, Lord Shen is highly intelligent and has above average skills as a hand-to-hand -hand combatant. The first to go does mostly by process of elimination, that being Prince Charming. Charming is egotistical and relatively smart, so we're not taking that away from him. And while he is a relatively skilled fighter, he is heavily outclassed by most of the other villains in the games. The insect-hating lawyer Leighton T. Montgomery is next to go. Montgomery is a lawyer, so his intelligence is not in question here. However, due to his stature, he's not very good at hiding and he's not shown to be a combatant in any capacity. Those facts combined mean he's not getting away from this brawl. The next villain to go during this game is Gigagne, who is not a combatant, which already puts him at a disadvantage. But combine the fact that he's only average in both stealth and intelligence, and he's not making out of this game. We're also seeing Miss Grunion die in this game. Grunion is much like the previous entrance, not really a combatant, add that to her large stature making it hard to be stealthy and her only average intelligence, it means she's unlikely to survive this game. The final villain to die during this game is Hendrix. Hendrix is a newer villain on our list and is sort of just average across the board. He's a big guy but isn't really a combatant and is of average intelligence. But like Grunion and Montgomery, he's a big guy which makes and hard for him to hide, hence why he doesn't survive. We are left with 18 of our original 30 when we come upon our next game, that being Tug of War. In Tug of War, there are two things required if you wish to win. You need the strength to pull the rope against the others and the teamwork that can be used to pull the rope even better. 
Now, none of these villains will be in specific teams, but we're assuming they are in some unknown team. Standout survivors of this game include the ever-present Tai Lung, whose intense strength outweighs his lack of team skills. Galaxar is more than willing to work on a team and has above average human strength. Chantel Dubois has near superhuman strength, and Dr. Irwin is a team player with average human strength. Sadly, the first villain to go during this game is Lord Farquaad. It's no surprise he dies in this game because not only is he nearly unable to work in a team, but his short stature doesn't help in the strength category. Another Shrek villain, the Fairy Godmother, also has to go. She already has below average strength due to her age and stature, but she's also not one who likes working in a team. Combine these two things and you're set up for failure. The Boogeyman, Pitch Black, is also eliminated during this game. This is due to his complete lack of wishing to work in a team. He doesn't work well in a team and only has average strength, so it's no wonder he goes down. Crazed scientist Professor Poopy Pants also ends up down at the bottom. This is because he already has a severe lack of strength, but he is also not a team player, at least not in this continuity. Finally, we're also dropping Dr. Zara from the list. This is due to her lack of strength owing to her smarts rather than her strength. She does, however, seem likely to work on a team, but it's hard to tell, especially considering her lack of strength. We now have only 13 of our original 30 villains left in the games. We now move on to the Marvel game. Winning the Marvel game requires one skill, the ability to manipulate others. Those who are master manipulators are shoo-ins to win, and those who are easily manipulated are highly unlikely to survive. The master manipulators likely to survive are Rumpelstiltskin for obvious reasons, Lord Shen who's quite the villainous manipulator, and Humpty Alexander Dumpty being able to manipulate Puss in Boots relatively easy. The first to go is Colonel Custer, who may be an all-around threat, but he severely lacks in the manipulation category. Next to go is Lord Victor Quartermain, who is very similar to Custer in a few regards. He lacks skills in the manipulation category, although he is a relatively good liar, so that helps a bit. The next villain to go is none other than Chantel Dubois. Chantel is a threat in most categories, but her lack of manipulation skills is the nail in the coffin for her. Finally, we have to see Drago Bloodvis go. Although he is quite hard to manipulate, it is hard to win if you can't manipulate. That leaves us down to the final 9 surviving villains as we move into the second to last game, The Glass Bridge. To survive The Glass Bridge is a hard thing to figure out but it seems like it comes down to two things, your ego and the likelihood you can tell tempered glass from regular glass. Your ego also determines which number you would pick, which may spell the difference between life and death for the villains. The first to go is Cheskel Khan. Khan is weird because while he has an ego, it's not massive and is actually much less than some others. But due to the fact he has enough of an ego to pick a high number, he'd probably fall. A massive ego on our list is Tai Lung. Tai Lung feels that he is the true dragon warrior and calls himself as such. Due to this, it's no surprise he would pick a high number. Tell me how proud you are, he may be one of the few who would actually fight to pick number one. A big head with a similarly big ego up next is Galatar. He is probably the second biggest ego on this list right behind Tai Lung. His big ego is definitely what throws him under the bus, even if he may be able to tell the difference between the glasses. The other Kung Fu Panda villain, Lord Shen, goes next on our list. Shen has a high enough ego to slay every panda just because of a prophecy and the thought that no one should or could surpass him. So yeah, he definitely ties here. Previous baby, Francis E. Francis, is next on the list. This is due to his ego, obviously. He was egotistical enough to think that because he couldn't stay a baby, puppies needed to surpass them. So he definitely fails during this game and crashes to the bottom. We're also dropping Rumpelstiltskin onto our list. This is because he has a pretty large ego, especially when you consider how he became emperor of Far Far Away. You kids don't exist. It's no surprise his ego would destroy him in this game. By process of elimination, we're also adding Dr. Erwin Armstrong to the list. He has an average ego, but this is overshadowed by the fact that he hates the word no so much that he disguised himself as an old man to train babies to kill people. So he fails at this game. Guess that's a no for him. 
Now we're down to our final two as they face off against each other in the titular Squid Game. Winning the Squid Game eventually comes down to one-on-one -on -one combat. The more skilled you are in one-to-one -one combat, the more likely you are to survive. The survivors of the previous game and the two who have to face each other now are Humpty Alexander Dumpty and Grimmel the Grizzly, which is undoubtedly an easy choice. The loser of this game is none other than Humpty Dumpty. Despite his intense intelligence and his manipulative skills, he just doesn't stand a chance against someone as ruthless as Grimmel the Grizzly. I mean, it's even in the name. Unlike the Disney villains, these ones were more well-rounded and were a lot harder to figure out. This made decisions for them hard, but in the end, Grimmel the Grizzly is the villain most likely to survive Squid Game. Forget about all this! Let me get rid of Dracula right now! I was so close to him, I couldn't just... <laughs> We've done Disney, we've done DreamWorks, and we've done Pixar. Naturally, the next studio in line for the Squid Game treatment would be Sony Animation. After all, their villains are fun, entertaining, and even intimidating when they want to be. So why not see how their skills would compare against each other? I'm Caleb with Wicked Binge, and I'm here to tell you which Sony Animation villain would win Squid Game. Much like Pixar, you may be seeing a few, let's just say out there, contestants due to how unique Sony's villain lineup is. But as always, we're going to try to make things as fair as possible, which means no no superpowers, gadgets, or weapons. With that detail out of the way, our contestants are Tank, Shaw, Chef Quasimodo, Mayor Shelbourne, Bella, Smiler, Black Bellamy, Queen Victoria, Chester V, King Leonard Mudbeard, Zeta, Erica Van Helsing, Abraham Van Helsing, Gargamel from Smurfs the Lost Village, The Royal Hunter, Pockets, Doc Ock, The Prowler, Kingpin, Pal, and Lutador for a total of 21 contestants. As always, we'll start with our first game, Red Light Green Light. Red Light Green Light is a game that's all about speed and sharp listening skills. The goal is to make it to the finish line as fast as you can. However, if a player is too focused on the finish line to realize when a red light is coming up, or if they easily panic and accidentally move or stumble when they're supposed to freeze, this game could spell their doom. Someone who does extremely well in this game is Erica, as we've seen just how acrobatic she can be. Similarly, Pockets, who is pretty much a master with his feet, would do very well. The Prowl aka Aaron Davis is also incredibly agile. Additionally, as an assassin and mercenary, he's a great listener too. Finally, as a hunter, the royal hunter would be able to move quickly while also keeping an ear out for instructions. Looking at those who wouldn't do so well in this game, we unfortunately have to get rid of our most recent Sony villain, Pal, right off the bat. As much as we may love her, without her robots, she's just a smartphone. Given that she isn't allowed to have these robots with her in the game, Pal quickly ends up with a bullet through her screen. Someone else who would have a hard time in this game would be Abraham Van Helsing. He may have had a good chance of passing when he was younger, but with how slow his new robotic body is, we just can't see him crossing the finish line in time. That is, if the gears in his body are even able to freeze in time with the red lights. The only other death in this game is Shaw. While yes, we're sure that he'd be a decent listener since he's another character who's a hunter, we have to remember that the guy is kind of insane. This combined with his paranoia makes him just unstable enough to likely panic during this intense game. With 18 of our villains surviving, it's time for our next game, Papagi or Honeycomb. The Honeycomb game requires patience and a steady hand. Too much shaking or pressure could cause a fatal break. As such, our contestants will need to have enough focus to poke out their shape without accidentally breaking it. While pirates aren't exactly known for a gentle touch, we think that Black Bellamy would do well in this game. He's a chill dude and, as a pirate, probably has a pretty steady hand when it comes to things like knives and cutlasses too. So we think he'd be able to pass this round. As an inventor, we feel that Chester V would also have a steady hand in this game, as well as a ton of patience. The same could be said for scientist and villainous extraordinaire Doc Ock. Another character with an insane amount of patience would be Smiler. After all, her whole thing is staying happy. And we also see her use small dentistry tools to keep her teeth clean, so we know she has a steady hand too. Unfortunately, we can't say that Ludador doesn't share this same success. Like Pal before him, this death is kind of unfair since as a snake, Ludador doesn't exactly have hands. But hey, them's the breaks. Another character that gets screwed over by their biology is Tank. 
penguin flippers aren't exactly super steady or careful, nor would they likely be able to grip a needle very well. This, combined with Tank's additional strength and below average intelligence, spells his doom. We also have to say goodbye to Kingpin. Yeah, we're sure this one hurts, but with how insanely strong this guy is and how big his hands are, we just don't think he would be able to pass this one, no matter how much patience he may have. Finally, due to Bella's intense anger issues and reckless nature, we felt that he would also die in this game. Looking at our remaining contestants, we're left with 14 Sony Animation Betty still standing. Following the Honeycomb game, we of course have the Midnight Brawl. Lack of food and sleep plus the stress of staying alive can drive any person to the point of violence, and in these games, it's every contestant for themselves. To survive this game, a person must be either strong enough to fight or clever and sneaky enough to hide. So, who would be able to either fend off attackers or properly hide themselves until the brawl was over? Just like in the first round, we see Erica, Pockets, and Aaron all do extremely well, as all of them are very skilled combatants and could easily fight off anyone who tries to cross them. Though Chester V is more brain than brawn, his intelligence and strange flexibility would definitely help his stealth allowing him to sneak through this game unscathed. Though he may have a bit of a height disadvantage, Chef Quasimodo showed in the first movie. Another big winner in this round is Her Majesty Queen Victoria. Despite the royal stereotype, Vicky is actually surprisingly adept with a pair of katanas. And although she can't use weapons in the games, we still feel like she'd be able to kick some ass. We can't, however, say the same for Mayor Shelbourne. Not only is he lacking in the strength department, but the guy's a bit of a coward, often bailing or blaming others when he senses trouble. But while he is sneaky, considering that this is the guy who ate his escape boat, we don't think that he's smart enough to find a good hiding spot either. Keeping with the theme of incompetent leaders, Leonard also falls in this game. Though he may be greedy and charismatic, he can also be pretty dim-witted and can't quite outmatch the other characters in this game. The final death in this game is the wizard Gargamel. Though he may be a decently skilled wizard and alchemist, without his magic powers, he just doesn't stand much of a chance. With several more contestants permanently down for the count and 11 villains still left standing, it's time for another strength-based game, Tug of War. Unlike the actual Squid Game, we aren't going to assign characters to specific teams. Instead, we're simply going to judge them based on their abilities and likelihood to survive. To win Tug of War, you don't just need strength, you also need strategy and a willingness to work with others. Even weaker players have a shot at surviving if they can coordinate properly with stronger players. As a captain, Black Bellamy already knows how to lead a crew or a team, and that combined with his decent strength makes him a shoe-in for this game. Aaron is pretty strong on his own, and given that we see him work alongside several other Spider-Man baddies in Spider-Verse, we feel that he would also be able to work in a team well. Given that she studied physics while in school, we think that Zeta would actually be able to come up with an effective strategy for this game. We also have to take into account her status as a leader, also very helpful in a game like Tug of War. We see throughout the second Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs movie that Chester V is often commanding his army of holograms. This mixed with his genius intellect would make him a great team leader for this game. Good thing too, otherwise this string bean wouldn't have stood a chance. Finally, as much as she may want to be in charge, Queen Vicky is still a diplomat of sorts and wouldn't be prideful enough to ignore her team's input as long as following their lead meant saving her own skin. One character who does fall in this game, however, is Pockets. And no, that isn't because of the whole hands in his pockets thing, we're sure that he'd take them out for this game. Pockets is, however, incredibly self-absorbed, and this pride and greediness can make him act foolish. We just don't see him meshing well with his team. We should also point out how isolated the Royal Hunter can be. Only being loyal to King Herod and how this is ultimately his biggest failing in a team-focused game like this one. He was even willing to let his own dogs die to try and save his skin. While he may be decently strong, we've run through the tug-of-war scenario enough to know that strength isn't everything. It can still matter, however, which is why the final death of the game is Quasimodo. Yes, he may have experience with ropes being a bell ringer and all, but there's a big difference between pulling on a bell and pulling against a team, and his short height probably doesn't help much either. With another game done and over with, we're left with eight contestants. Up next, we have The Marble Game. Marbles is an interesting one, at least in the context of Squid Game. There are multiple ways for pairs of players to play their marble game. 
They could focus on accuracy or how far they can roll their marble, or they can simply guess how many marbles are in their opponent's hand. As such, there are multiple ways to win, with most of these ways relying on either skill or luck. Of course, if you don't have the skills to win, there's always manipulation. Again, both Queen Victoria and Chester V really shine here, as both of them have been shown to be great manipulators. With Vicky managing to persuade the pirate captain to part with Polly and Chester V turning flint against his friends. Doc Ock is a very patient and intelligent woman, and given how she was able to get Peter B to let his guard down around her, we think she would do just fine in this game. Our other remaining Spidey villain also does well, though not necessarily because he's a manipulator. Again, Aaron is an assassin, so he is probably used to noticing small details and successfully hitting targets. So, when it comes to the actual game of marbles, he wins easily. Similarly, Zeta's knowledge of physics once again comes in handy in this game. What, you've never heard of Thurman? Even if she isn't too manipulative, you don't really need to be if you can play the game near perfectly. Unfortunately, after making it farther than we would have expected, it's finally time to say so long to Black Bellamy. Though it may have saved him in the honeycomb, this is where Bellamy's chill nature comes back to bite him. Even if Bellamy can be mischievous and a bully when he wants to be, it just can't compare to our other finalists. Another fan favorite, Erica also falls in this game. We saw throughout the third movie that Erica can sometimes let her anger and impatience get the better of her, causing her to fail at assassinating Drac. She was also pretty unobservant when it came to the booby traps in Atlantis, and being unobservant in this game is pretty much a death sentence. Our final death of this game is Smiler. While she is essentially the leader of the phone, Smiler is more a bossy dictator than an outright manipulator. She may put on a happy persona, but like with Bellamy, we just don't think that goes very far when put up against the other baddies. We're now officially down to our final five, and just in time for one of this competition's deadliest games, Glass Stepping Stones. This game is another tricky one for a hypothetical scenario, as much of this game relies on luck. There is one strategy to it, however, that being the advantage of going last after some glass pieces have already been broken. As such, those who have a big enough ego to want to try a game first will likely seal their doom. Naturally, as Queen, Victoria would probably insist on going first. If not, just shove people out of the way so she could go first. So, it's no surprise that she dies in this game. The next person to die would likely be Chester V. Given his intelligence and his ability to play to his advantage, we feel at this point Chester V would be feeling pretty confident and untouchable. But unless you have supervision, you can can't exactly outwit Glass, and since he would be one of the first to go, Chester wouldn't be able to follow the path of others. Our final death is the sassy bird Zeta. It really is a shame that Zeta isn't allowed to just use her wings, otherwise this game would be a breeze for her. Outside of that, we also felt her ego would be big enough for her to pick a middle to high number, sealing her fate. Just like in the show, our final challenge will be a one-on-one -on -one duel in the titular Squid Game. In this game, two opponents must go up against one another, with one acting as defender and the other as an attacker, with the attacker doing everything they can to reach the top of the court or the squid's head, and touch it with their foot, with the defender doing whatever they can to stop them. Or at least, that's how Squid Game is traditionally played. Here though, it's more of a battle to the death type of deal. This time around, it's a battle of the Spider-Man villains it would seem. Doc Ock versus the Prowler. As such, this is even more of a close call than it usually is. Both villains are pretty tough and know how to fight, even without their weapons or gadgets. Aaron is a bit stronger physically, while Doc Ock takes an advantage in the intelligence department. Ultimately though, we decided that Doc Ock would be the one most likely to die in this game. Aaron was the Kingpin's top hitman, and is agile and a master in combat while also having great endurance and durability. Olivia may have superhuman strength and speed with her tentacles, but without them, she's just an ordinary woman with an above average brain. We aren't saying she can't still fight without her tentacles, but we don't think that she would last as long as Aaron could. Her only saving grace would be if she could figure out a winning strategy, but even then, considering Aaron was an assassin that kills people for a living, we don't think she'd have much of a chance to enact one in time. So, in the end, it's the Prowler who's walking away with the cash. This win may be a bit controversial since it could be argued whether or not the Prowler was a true villain, despite all that he did considering that he sacrificed himself for miles. But hey, all the more reason to be happy that he did win.
one push of this button, and I send that rocket straight into the same volcano where I faked my death. Only this time is for real. Yeah, we're, we're still doing this, folks. Bringing some of our favorite animated characters to play some not-so-friendly games. At this point, it only seems right to finally touch on a studio that, while maybe not the most profound or respected when compared to Pixar or even DreamWorks, still has plenty of fans. Illumination. The studio has a lot of lovable characters who know how to fight, scheme, and even save the day. But which one will come out on top? Hey guys, I'm Brad with Wicked Bench, and we're here to figure out which Illumination character would win Squid Game. As always, every character who enters the Squid Game loses access to any weapons or extraordinary abilities. You know, gotta level the playing field. Additionally, while some Illumination franchises are obviously gonna have more representation than others, we're gonna try to include at least a couple of characters from each Illumination's fully animated film franchises. With that said, let's go over our players. From Despicable Me, we have Gru, Drew, Marlena, Gru's mother, Lucy Wilde, Dr. Nefario, Vector, Mr. Perkins, El Macho, and Balthazar Brat. Moving on to its spinoff, Minions, we have Kevin, Bob, Stuart, Otto, Scarlet Overkill, Herb Overkill, Master Chow, Wild Knuckles, and Bellbottom. Can't have an Illumination Squid Game without throwing in some Dr. Seuss characters, so we're also including the Wunzler, the Lorax, Granny Norma, Ted's grandmother, Aloysius O'Hare, and of course, the Grinch. From the Secret Life of Pets, we also have Max, Duke, Gidget, and Snowball. Finally, we have our Sing characters. And if you've seen our Anthro Characters Squid Game video, you know that we've already included the main characters from that franchise. So for this game, we're selecting Eddie Noodleman, Nana Noodleman, Big Daddy, Johnny's father, Portia Crystal, Clay Calloway, Nushi, and Klaus Kicking Clover. As always, we'll start with our first game, Red Light Green Light. Red Light Green Light is a game that's about speed and sharp listening skills. The goal is to make it to the finish line as fast as you can. However, if a player is too focused on the finish line to realize when a red light is coming up, or if they easily panic and accidentally move or stumble when they're supposed to freeze, this game could spell their doom. Of the players who have the easiest time with this game, ABL agent Lucy Wilde is certainly one of them. Being a secret agent, she's not only used to following orders, but she's also fast, agile, and has a cool head when it comes to danger. Another character who wouldn't struggle too badly with this challenge is Master Chow. Though this particular game doesn't require any combat prowess, Chow is still incredibly fast as well as patient. Normally, elderly characters struggle a lot with this game. Granny Norma, however, is an exception. Being someone who falls into the cool grandma character archetype, Norma is athletic and even strategic, as we saw when she was evading O'Hare's security guards. Similarly, despite having a body that doesn't look like it would be very athletic, we've seen that Otto can not only be very fast, but very determined. Additionally, his small size could give him an advantage, and that he could hide behind much bigger characters. Speaking of evading, both Nushi and Klaus are talented dancers that are both quick and graceful on their feet. I don't see your tippy toes! Since every good dancer needs to be able to dance along to the beat of the music, we can assume that they both got pretty good listening skills too. As for this round's deaths, the first one, unfortunately, is Dr. Nefario. Yeah, remember what we said a moment ago about elderly characters? Well, Dr. Nefario has all the elder traits that you don't want to have when playing this, like poor hearing and a slow-moving body. The next character to die is Eddie Noodleman. Unlike his best friend, Buster Moon, Eddie doesn't have nearly as much determination or as much nerve. In fact, he's a bit on the anxious side, and we feel that all the chaos would result in him most likely panicking, which is never a good thing. Following him is a fan-favorite villain, Vector. Yeah, we're sure a few of you are disappointed with this. However, for as smart as Vector may be, we just couldn't see him having the athletic skills needed to survive, given how much he relies on his gadgets. Our next character, Aloysius O'Hare, dies for a similar reason. O'Hare is a CEO who relies on his personal bodyguards to act as both his muscle and transport. Without them, he just doesn't have the athleticism, or height, to make it to the finish line. We could also see him acting irrationally when things get down to the wire, like he does when he learns Ted has a truffle tree seed. A cool head is key, and O'Hare doesn't have that. The final death of Red Light Green Light is Stuart. 
Out of all the minions, Stuart is most likely to mess around when he's feeling bored or cocky, which would naturally seal his fate. With 29 of our players surviving, it's time for our next game, Honeycomb. The Honeycomb game requires patience and a steady hand. Too much shaking or pressure could cause a fatal break. As such, our contestants will need to have enough focus to poke out their shape without accidentally breaking it. To the delight of former fangirls everywhere, we can see the Onceler doing quite well in this challenge. He has fairly nimble fingers, and we've seen that he both knows how to sew and how to play the guitar. Both likely gave him some pretty steady hands as well as patience. Another guitar player we see making their way out of this game alive is Clay Calloway. While his paws may not be as nimble as Oncey's fingers, he still seems to have a lot of skill with them. Herb is also a standout. Being an inventor, he's likely used to working with tiny tools and screws, as well as fragile circuitry. Add in his chill nature, and he definitely is a shoe in Naturally, Chow once again succeeds. Given that she's an acupuncturist by trade, she's already skilled with being precise, steady, and gentle. As for the losers, uh, this is not a great round for the secret life of pets, Max, Duke, and Gidget. Due to them lacking opposable thumbs and thus not having much of a chance at getting the honeycomb out, the only pets character that makes it out alive is Snowball, since he not only has more flexible paws, but he also has his teeth, which he's used before to do things like turn a carrot into an escape key, so he has a couple of options when it comes to getting his honeycomb out. We're also going to be saying goodbye to Mr. Perkins. Remember, this is a guy who was able to crush an apple with his bare hand without even breaking a sweat. Strong hands like that can be a death sentence. Perkins is also impatient, which is a huge detriment. The final death, sadly, is Big Daddy. Being a gorilla with huge and powerful hands, Big Daddy didn't stand much of a chance. Looking at our remaining contestants, we're left with 24 players still standing. Following the Honeycomb game, we of course have the Midnight Brawl. Lack of food and sleep, plus the stress of staying alive, can drive any person to the point of violence. And in these games, it's every player for themselves. To survive, a person must be either strong enough to fight or clever and sneaky enough to hide. So, who would be able to either fend off attackers or properly hide themselves until the brawl was over? Obviously, someone like Wild Knuckles is gonna have an easy time, being a skilled fighter who has the ability to take on multiple opponents at once. Gru may not be as skilled of a hand-to-hand -hand fighter as his villainous mentor, but he does have some impressive fighting skills. At the very least, he knows how to throw a good punch. In the first Minions movie, we saw that Scarlet was much more than a pretty face, being someone who could take on at least a dozen different villains at once when she invited them to steal a ruby from her. Speaking of Minions, we feel that both Kevin and Bob actually don't have too hard of a time. After all, we saw them learn martial arts in the rise of Gru, and even if they can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the other great fighters, they're small enough to easily hide. This goes double for both the Lorax and the Grinch, as both characters have shown that they know how to sneak around in the dark, ensuring their safety even if they can't really fight back physically. Moving on to the depths, we're sad to say that our remaining minion, Otto, isn't as lucky. While yes, he does have the same small and thus easy-to-hide body as Kevin and Bob, Otto also has one extra trait that would prevent him from staying hidden and surviving. His motor mouth and inability to be quiet. The next character to fall is Nana Noodleman. While she may look somewhat intimidating, Nana is still an older woman who doesn't seem to be much of an actual fighter, relying more on her glares to intimidate people. I say, you are a liar, Mr. Moon. Unfortunately, that's not enough this time around. Portia Crystal also dies. Portia is not only young, but can also be pretty emotional, so we could see her panicking once the lights go out. The next character on the chopping block, sadly, is Herb. Being the complete opposite of his wife in terms of personality and not having much power without his weapons, we couldn't see Herb making it out. It was me, her. Now, you could argue that Scarlet would try to protect him, but given that she'd likely have tons of people going after her to try and get her out of the game, Herb would likely be without that protection. Sorry, Herb. And finally, we have to say goodbye to Klaus. While his dancing skills might have helped him through the first game, Klaus seems to struggle in actual, non-choreographed fights, as we see in the Sky Full of Stars performance from Sing 2. Okie dokie, there's 19 players left. It's time for another game of strength, Tug of War. Unlike the actual Squid Game, we're not going to assign characters to specific teams. Instead, we're simply going to judge them based on their abilities and likelihood to survive. 
To win tug of war, you don't just need strength, you also need strategy and a willingness to work with others. Even weaker players have a shot at surviving if they can coordinate properly with stronger players. We're sure some of you would be pleased to hear that we think the brothers, Gru and Drew, would likely make it through. Gru is both smart and strong, having both strategy and muscle on his side, as well as a willingness to work with others, so long as they aren't outright hostile. Hey, hey, as for Drew, while he may not be as talented or skilled as his twin, he at the very least knows how to work with the team and very much has the enthusiasm of a team player. Nushi also has this enthusiasm, as we see her being the type to support others, even people she barely knows, and we can't forget her athleticism. El Macho is also a shoe in Not only is he incredibly strong, but he's also one of the few villains we see who are willing to work with others, as he did with Nefario and when he offers a partnership deal to Gru. While our two remaining minions are on the tiny side, Kevin and Bob have shown that they can sometimes be stronger than they look. Also, being minions, their whole thing is being able to work together, which also gives them a better chance. But the same can't be said for Snowball, who is the first to go. He's more a leader than a follower, and more importantly, he doesn't have enough bunny strength to pull off a win. We also have to eliminate the Lorax for also being incredibly small and lightweight. Yeah, he probably have good teamwork skills, but while those are important in tug of war, they can only get you so far. We're also saying goodbye to both Balthazar Brat and Bellbottom. Both villains are incredibly self-centered and don't exactly play nice with others. Brat's only companions are robots that he can command, while Belle betrayed one of her oldest teammates for no reason. Party's over, old man. We can see them being so focused on trying to be their team's leader that they fail to win the actual game. Tough break. All right, 15 contestants left. Next, we have the Marble Game. Marbles is interesting, at least in the context of Squid Game. There are multiple ways for pairs of players to play their marble game. They could focus on accuracy, or how far they can roll their marble, or they can simply guess how many marbles are in their opponent's hand. There are multiple ways to win, with most relying on either skill or luck. Of course, if you don't have the skills to win, there's always manipulation. Surprisingly, we could see El Macho and Scarlet Overkill doing pretty well. While El Macho may seem more like a physically focused guy, we've seen that he can be clever, sneaky, and strategic, given how long he was able to stay undercover and plan his revenge on the world. We could have ruled the world together, bro. As for Scarlet, despite her temper, she does in fact know how to use others to her advantage, and how to act nice to get someone's guard down. While she may be more genuine than El Macho or Scarlet, Nushi makes it through. Based on her steady hands and keen eye, two great things to have when playing a game of marbles. Similarly, Master Chow once again excels, thanks to her skilled hands, patience, and accuracy. Moving on to the depths, we sadly have to say goodbye to Gru. Given that both he and Lucy are still in the game, they would essentially be like the husband and wife we saw in the actual Squid Game, being forced to choose which one would survive. When it comes down to it, we just can't see Gru choosing his own life over Lucy's. Sadly, they aren't the only pair who have to make a hard choice. Between our remaining two minions, we feel like Kevin would let his protective older brother-esque nature take over, thus pushing him to sacrifice himself for Bob's sake. Ouch. And Drew is likely to go. Simply put, Drew just isn't as clever or as skilled as his twin, and without Gru helping him out, his death just seems like an inevitability. Finally, while he may not have any personal connections within the game, we can't see Clay Calloway actively choosing to kill someone else. He'd play the game, but we feel like he wouldn't be too focused or determined to win. Outside of our noble sacrifices, the Onceler is also likely to die. Through his interactions with his family, the Onceler is very easy to manipulate and trick. He can also make rash decisions when frustrated, and in this game, that can cost you everything. The final death in this round goes to the Grinch. Illumination's version of the Grinch is, ironically enough, a very emotional guy who can get easily stressed out. He's also not a people person, meaning that he would struggle to manipulate others. Finally, he's got fur-covered hands, so even if he did try his hardest at the actual game, all that fur would potentially make it pretty hard to shoot or roll marbles. We're officially down to our final nine, and just in time for one of this competition's deadliest games, Glass Stepping Stones. This is another tricky one for a hypothetical scenario, as much of this game relies on luck. 
There is one strategy to it, however, that being the advantage of going last. After some glass pieces have already been broken. As such, those who have a big enough ego to want to try a game first will likely seal their doom. Though not necessarily egotistical, Norma is brave for an old lady. She doesn't get shaken by much and seems to laugh in the face of danger, making it likely that she wouldn't worry too much about picking a high number. Another old lady, Marlena, also takes the long plunge. Being the opposite of Norma, Marlena often comes off as apathetic, not being someone to take things too seriously. These are my diving instructors. If anything, she'd probably pick a high number just to get the game over with as soon as possible, which would be a big mistake. Looking at some of the remaining big egos, Scarlet's is certainly the biggest. At this point in the games, we could see her being pretty confident and sure of herself, and thus not being afraid of being one of the first ones to play. But for as skilled as Scarlet is, not even she can tell heated and regular glass apart. Next on the chopping block is Nushi. Though her ego is not as big as Scarlet's, she has a lot of confidence. To be fair, her long limbs and dancing prowess would give her an advantage, but being in the middle of the pack would still give her some fairly low odds at successfully getting to the other side. Next in line is El Macho, who would also have a lot going for him. We saw at his evil lair that he had to memorize a pattern for his password, so when it comes to the memorization involved in this game, El Macho would have no problems. Unfortunately, his shorter legs and large body would make breaking an undiscovered regular piece of glass too easy. We now have to say goodbye to our final minion, Bob. Yes, despite being the most innocent minion of them all, he managed to outlast all of his minion brothers. The luck, however, stops here. Though he'd likely make it pretty far thanks to his mid to low number, Bob isn't always the most strategic or careful, and any fear that he would be feeling wouldn't help him keep a calm head. The final death on the glass bridge is Wild Knuckles. It was a close call, but while we could see Knuckles being strategic to pick a low number and having the legs to pull off some impressive jumps, Knuckles doesn't have any extraordinary skills that would help him memorize the pattern or help him tell apart the glass panels. Still, he probably would have gotten close to the end. Our two remaining players are Lucy Wilde and Master Chow. Both of these ladies are athletic, skilled, smart, patient, observant, and know how to think on their feet and act quickly. It just made sense that they'd make it to the final game. Just like in the show, our final challenge will be a one-on-one -on -one duel in the titular Squid Game. In Squid Game, two opponents must go up against one another, with one acting as a defender and the other as an attacker, with the attacker doing everything they can to reach the top of the court or the squid's head and touch it with their foot, with the defender doing whatever they can to stop them. Or at least that's how Squid Game is traditionally played. Here though, it's more of a battle to the death type of deal. As we said a minute ago, they're pretty similar to each other, so it was a close call. Ultimately, we had to pick Lucy to die. This was for a few reasons. First, while Lucy can fight, her style can at times be more chaotic than Chao's more traditional style. While this can provide an advantage through being less predictable, it can also be less reliable. We've also seen Lucy lose more fights than Chao, getting overpowered and tied up by both El Macho and Balthazar Brat. Brat, he took the girl! Chow, meanwhile, was able to fight off three guys at once without breaking a single sweat. Additionally, her knowledge of the human body would make finding her opponent's weak points easier. So congratulations to Master Chow, our Illumination Squid Game winner.